What is the current state of the mining industry and what are the implications for resource economies? To explore these questions, we talked to David Humphreys, who's best known for his roles as chief economist of Rio Tinto and Nordelsk and for his multiple publications in this field. David, welcome to Raw Talks. Good morning. You recently brought together 40 years of uh, your professional career into a book, The Remaking of the Mining Industry. So tell us, what do you mean by this remaking? Well, what I was trying to convey with this uh, word remaking was that the industry that went into the cycle was not the industry that emerged at the end. The boom actually catalyzed a number of important changes in the industry which have major implications for the future, and I enumerate in the book what some of those changes are. For example, I point to the fact that the customer base of the industry changed dramatically during the course of this period uh, from a situation where most demand in the industry was coming from the advanced economy countries to a situation where most was coming from the emerging market countries. An important shift in terms of the long-term behavior of the industry. Is this something particular to this cycle or, or is, uh, if we refer back to previous cycles we'll find the same sort of thing? Uh, it was quite an exceptional cycle. I'm not sure it was a unique cycle. I think if you look back at the cycle uh, that took place in the 1970s where um, Japan was the emerging industrial power at that time, you find a lot of parallels. Mm. Uh, in terms of its implications for the commodity market. So I don't think it's unique, but it was certainly a very long and sustained uh, cycle. Now the super cycle um, came and went. Today is a different world. Um, the key players, and I mean investors, governments, uh, developers, operators, mm -hmm. communities, um, have to adjust to this new world. Mm -hmm. How would you describe this new world? What is the current state of the industry? The industry is still adjusting, I think, from the consequences of this uh, quarter to super cycle, if you want, or long and sustained cycle. Clearly, the downside of this cycle has been a pretty traumatic event for them. They were getting used to the idea that uh, these kind of this strong demand that they'd seen with the rise of China, they expected it to be more sustainable, and in fact, turn, turned out to be the case. So now they're adjust adjusting to a new reality, which is. Um, uh, slower growth of markets, uh, more depressed prices, um, more cautious uh, investment policies. Uh, so this new normal, if you like, I mean, it actually looks quite like uh, the normal that we lived in prior to the great commodity boom. And yes, I mean, the industry, I think at the moment is um, kind of a little bit uncertain where the next direction is. It's operating a policy of kind of wait and see. I don't think they feel it's the time for visionary statements and bold actions. Yeah, I'd say this is a pretty normal kind of condition for the industry to find itself in coming off the back of a, of a strong uh, cycle. Only a few years back, uh, a lot of people, uh, and I mean analysts, commentators of the mm. industry, they suggested the end of cycles altogether and you were among those that argue against this idea uh, suggesting that the extractive industries are inherently cyclical uh, volatile I'm interested in exploring the uh, technical reasons for that for that why well, is this the case? In, indeed and, and I suppose my skepticism partly arose from the fact that I'd been in the industry quite a long time and seen <laughs> a few of these sort of cycles come and go so that the moment someone starts saying this time it, it's different you know and immediately you become on your guard yes I mean the industry I I is inherently um, cyclical um, for two strong reasons. One is because uh, the demand for the for the uh, for mineral products tends to be quite volatile uh, this in turn reflects the fact that a lot of minerals are used in capital goods, which is to say in construction and machinery, um, consumer durables and things of that nature. So it tends to have quite, quite a wide range of um, uh, fluctuations on the demand side. Meanwhile, the supply side is very sticky. I mean, it takes a long, long time to build a new mine uh, and to adjust to uh, supply imbalances. So you put the two together and you get the consequences of these rather characteristic uh, price cycles, uh, which vary in, in their magnitude, of course, and this one was a particularly, 
particularly big one, but fundamentally the mechanics behind it were the same as in. So, so what was the difference? I mean, was it really just about China? I, it was all. It was all about China. Uh, we were completely taken by surprise uh, by the scale of what what took place in China. Um, and and it, although in the late 90s uh, we were beginning to get a sense that something was moving, we had no idea of the speed and the scale at which it was uh, about to, to, to explode. And that, I do think, caught the industry unprepared because you know, it had years of, of, of cost cutting, of grinding down its investment, and so it was wholly unprepared for the strength uh, and the speed at which this demand out of China um, uh, arose. Now, people generalized from that and said, oh, well, it's China now, but it's, you know, it's really just one facet of the emerging world coming through and that when China you know, w uh, begins to slow, other countries will take on. But in retrospect, yeah, it was pretty much all about China. And, and if I remember correctly, actually, you have a paper with a very telling title, Beware of the Paradigm That Shifts. That's, this relates to, to, to what you were saying. Yes, I think I, I was warning against the idea that one should should uh, you know, take the the extraordinary events that were, were were occurring during the early part of that boom period and extrapolate them way into the future, which I think people were tempted to do. And uh, you know, when some of the people talking about a, the the super cycle were talking about a generation, they were talking about twenty years, two decades of uh, of commodity boom. There were a lot of investors who were beginning to get interested in the in the industry. Um, not, not because they were interested in you know, buying copper as an investment vehicle alongside bonds and, and equities and things of that nature. So there was a, a degree of hysteria beginning to build up a, around this that seemed to me to be uh, way beyond what the, in the fundamentals of the market uh, really suggested w was justified. Let's talk about investment. Long-term price forecasts remain uh, strong uh, and uh, even at the end of the, uh, of the cycle, and yet investment uh, came down. What matters to investors today? Well, I, I think in terms of uh, what the companies are doing, um, the, clearly prices haven't come back down to exactly where they were before the major boom, uh, but they have come down a long way and their margins have been squeezed to a level that actually is quite similar to where they were before uh, the boom. And as a consequence, they've very much cut back on um, exploration, on building new capacity and looking for developing new mines, trying to straighten out their balance sheets. They've written off a lot of the merger and acquisitions that took place during the boom years, trying to stabilize uh, things um, in preparation for, uh, for the future. I mean, in, for what they hope will be a recovery at some stage, but in the meantime, just steadying the ship. The one area that is going differently is, is what is happening with the Chinese investors, because they have taken the, the opportunity of this uh, cyclical downturn uh, to um, continue their expansion out onto the world stage. And there are a number of places now where uh, Chinese investors are quite active in acquiring some really quite good assets. Um, I'm thinking of things like min metals in, in, in Peru, Jing mining in Congo, in Papua New Guinea. Um, so a series of uh, uh, Chinalco in, in Guinea, of course, as you know. They are swimming against the tide in, in this respect and using lower prices to, to, to capitalize by buying new mines. But you say against the tide. Is that not actually what logic should, 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 should well, be? Well, uh, strictly, yes. I suppose a lot of companies talk about investing counter-cyclically, uh, investing during the barren years, if you like, so as to be ready when the boom arrives. But in reality, um, investors, uh, their investors, uh, are usually not happy to see companies um, being expansive when commodity prices uh, are low. Usually uh, they're freer with their checkbooks uh, when prices uh, are high. I mean, it is one of those kind of um, ironies, but and, and one of the things that unfortunately um, tends to exaggerate uh, up cycles and down cycles. If we look back to the, uh, to the, to the commodities boom, how um, have these resource economies managed to lock in some of their gains. Evidently, they've seen a lot of revenue mm. going through their economies. Uh, yeah. How did they do? Not massively differently than how they've done in the past, unfortunately. I mean, one of the, one of the differences with this last boom, perhaps with previous ones, is that there's been an enormous amount of research into issues of the, the resource curse and how better to manage uh, windfall gains from commodity booms. So there is quite a big body of research and literature now available to countries that want to do better than they have in the past with respect to investing the rents from, from mining, 
um, using commodity price stabilization schemes to neutralize the effects of, of commodity booms on their exchange rates to encourage diversity and so on. But if you look around countries and see what they've actually done, uh, they haven't really, on the whole, uh, taken the full benefit of, of, the, of those, those learnings, at least, so it seems to me. Those who can't remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Uh, the, the quote says, yeah. uh, the extractive industry, are, are we condemned to repeat history? And this goes back to this issue of cycles that we talked about. I'm not particularly optimistic. I mean, part of the reason for writing the book, I mean, is to impart a certain, you know, learnings about the past in the hope that people might in future be better prepared for w w what they encounter. But actually, you have a sort of generation of new people coming through, uh, probably a greater preparedness to believe this has never happened before. And certainly in governments, you have really quite a short time period um, in which politicians, uh, you know, are, are around often. They are you know, at least with, with, with corporate executives, they can have been in the industry a long time, but, but um, uh, government officials frequently uh, are imposed in a relatively short time. They want to make their mark. They need to get up that learning curve very quickly, and sometimes it's all over before they've really grasped. Uh, David, know. another uh, phenomenon that took place in the last uh, years, uh, and, and I wonder if it's not something that also is recurrent, mm is this issue of resource nationalism. Mm. And by mm. that I mean state-driven uh, mm. uh, initiatives yes. to try and enlarge their take from resource economics. Yeah. Uh, how how yeah. did that go? Well, I mean, it's quite natural that, that, that countries which, which have natural resources which want to use them uh, to, to, to leverage their, their development will seek to maximize you know, what they can get out of that industry and, and the benefits that they can derive from it. The point at which this spills over into resource nationalism, the point where those demands uh, become too extreme, become unreasonable, uh, where the rules of the game are changed for inward investors. Um, and we saw quite a, quite a few expressions of that where countries basically overreacted to what was taking place um, and, and became um, too acquisitive <laughs> in terms of what they they tried to take from the industry. And, and you know, the, the classic I illustration of this, as you know, is the, the obsolescing bargain, you know, is that the power shifts from the investor towards the host government as the, uh, the, the project uh, shifts through its various stages. By the time the project is built, the host government is often in a position to go back and rewrite the terms uh, in a way that renders the whole project uneconomic for its life. And I mean, this is the nightmare with which all big investors in this sector live. And as you said, as soon as the uh, conditions change, the bargaining power changes sure. and uh, you lose the opportunity. Have we seen a lot of um, opportunities missed? Oh, uh, unquestionably. I, don't, well, I mean, one of the rather depressing aspects of the, the boom that we've been through is how few uh, countries have been sort of added to the list uh, of those that one might regard as being uh, safe uh, target countries for, for investment. I mean, a number of, uh, of countries invited investors in, but they fell short of actually getting the commitment to those uh, big investments. And Mongolia is one country that did actually manage to acquire some large um, inward in, in investment. But I mean, the fact that I can mention one country means it's a very short list. And most investment in the mining industry continues to go to the same countries that it's always gone to. I mean, Australia, Canada, Chile, uh, Peru and so on. Perhaps the other side of uh, the same coin is um, what some people call resource neo-mercantilism, mm -hmm. which is state efforts to get access to resources outside of their own borders. Um, China as a good example of the going out policies. Why do these countries need to do that? Why not rely on the market? Well, there are different types of, uh, of, of resource mercantilism, I guess. One that you, you point to is, is China going out and, and, and seeking to uh, acquire resources uh, through state organizations by in encouraging investment in, in third countries to secure supplies for their own industries. And we've already talked a little bit about you know, China's um, global strategy with respect to mining. But there's another aspect of mercantilism, which is countries which have resources um, and which then impose export restrictions to ensure that the processing of those resources takes place within their countries and they get the benefit of the value added rises from the processing. And that is now quite widespread. I mean, in Indonesia is the most classic example of this, which banned the export of um, all unprocessed minerals from early 2014 and insisted that all of those 
commodities, whether it's bauxite or copper or nickel, were processed through to a refined form in Indonesia as part of its development program. Now, um, there's nothing fundamental, it's nothing inherently wrong with this policy, uh, but its logic does depend a little bit on uh, the circumstances of the individual country. Sometimes it makes sense, sometimes it doesn't. It's not, an, it's not a, a general rule that can be applied everywhere because the competitive advantage of mining are not always the same competitive advantage of, of processing, which tends to be more sort of technical, tends to require more capital equipment, tends to require um, you know, reliable power sources and things of that nature, which a slightly different range of criteria for competitiveness to those which uh, apply in, on the mine, where you know the, 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 the ore body and infrastructure and so on tend to be rather more important. But I wouldn't uh, like to let you go without talking about the future. Yeah. Uh, and in a way, going back to, to your book, there's always this overhanging anxiety in the industry that we may run out of um, resources. Uh, after all, they are non-renewable. However, you argue in your book that the key supply side challenges are in fact above the ground as opposed to underground. Tell us what are going to be these issues in the next five to ten years? One of them is the one we've already been talking about, geopolitics. And uh, I, I think the whole thrust towards uh, nationalism, this, this isn't confined to the resources sector. I mean, we're seeing nationalism you know, and deglobalization breaking out all over. I mean, and resource nationalism is just one rather small component of this more general outbreak of um, uh, of nationalism, of nativism, populism, protectionism, and so on. So, so that is clearly going to be a major above-ground issue that will shape what takes place in the industry. Mining has, in the past, tended to focus on below-ground issues, which is to say, what's in the ground and how do we get it out? And what I wanted to say is, yes, we still have those issues, but increasingly important to those that we deal with uh, above the ground. We have land issues, we have water issues, uh, and we have uh, emissions issues, emissions to the air. And in all those areas, I see the challenges of, of the industry mounting in future. Uh, waste issues, I mean mining, and, and, and particularly as you go to lower and lower grades of material, um, the amount of waste generated increases all the time. Uh, people become less tolerant to uh, seeing the disposal of this waste, and then you have um, uh, accidents such as happened in, in, in Samarco in, in Brazil last year that kind of draw attention to the potential consequences um, of uh, waste management when it goes wrong. A number of the biggest mining areas of the world are water stressed issues. Uh, Chile, um, uh, Peru, Southern Africa, West Australia and so on. So this is going to be a bigger issue for the future. There are means of dealing with it, desalinization, but they come at a high cost. Uh, and the last issue is emissions. Well, um, mining itself is not particularly energy intensive or, or emissions intensive, but the processing of those things uh, often is. So the combination of those things in future, I think, is going to become more important. And, and what I say in the book is that the draw on these other resource systems is potentially as big a constraint uh, on future production as the availability of raw material in the ground. And a lot of these issues have been um, uh, dealt with under the umbrella of sustainable development in the past. So what you're saying is that that agenda remains valid and probably more. Oh, absolutely. And I mean, and there are people who talk about the resource nexus, basically approaching this from the perspective of saying that all resource systems are, in, you know, are interlinked. And we need in future to think of these resource systems as, as part of a whole and not just focus down on, on the one particular resource and its availability, but look at the knock-on consequences of its extraction you know, in relation to all the other resource systems that it employs. David, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Nick.